Esther. What a lady, the bringer of truth, revelation of God's purpose in your life. We pick up the story about seven years into King Xerxes' reign, and uh, he's throwing a massive 180-day party. Historians say it's because he realizes the Greeks are becoming a problem, and he needs all of his generals and captains get behind him. After the 180-day campaign to raise support, he's over. He throws a seven-day banquet to thank everyone in his kingdom who helped him throw the 180-day party. He calls for his queen, Vashti. It says he wants to parade her and show her beauty off to all that are there. We don't know what she would have needed to go through. She knew exactly what she was doing when she denied him access to her. She sends word back. She says, I am not coming. That was a crime punishable by death. She clearly did not want to be humiliated, broken down again by this evil king who just wanted to show everyone how rich he was, how wealthy he was. She says, no, he is vexed, is an understatement. He, ba- he doesn't kill her, but he banishes her from his sight. She's never allowed to see him again. He strips her of her crown. She's no longer queen. And then he's advised to throw a beauty contest for all the beautiful wo- uh, women in his 127 provinces. They brought from all over his known kingdom, this beauty contest to see if anyone would become his new queen. Esther is said, not only is she beautiful, but she also have a stunning figure. It's like she was as the most beautiful woman, clearly the most beautiful woman in this 5,000 square kilometer kingdom that he sat over because she's put into the shortlist of seven beautiful virgins. She's then put through a year-long beauty treatment. And at the end of the beauty treatment, she uh, is presented to the king. She wins the competition. She becomes the queen. This sounds very romantic, but it's not so much. Probably a very, very young girl. For someone as beautiful as her, without a real family, you see she was orphaned as a young age. Her mother and her father both died. She had no siblings. Her, her, in actual fact, the person looking after her, his name is Mordecai. He, he is her much older cousin and the only family member she has to take her in. Being as beautiful as she was, if she was older than just have gone through puberty, she would have been snapped up in a heartbeat to be married to someone else. She was a young, young, young girl. She gets told, you're going into this competition. What it means is if she loses the competition, she still joins the king's harem. She's never allowed to get married. She's banished to a loveless life. And she's stuck in the palace until the day she dies. So she goes, beautiful lady. She finds favor with everyone she meets. Everybody falls in love with her. She's clearly polite and friendly. The captain of the eunuchs that is preparing these girls puts her in the most elevated position. He gives her everything she needs. Everyone she meets just loves her. She's clearly got a beautiful attitude. She loves to serve. We know her as a thoughtful, caring girl. Even in the, in the palace as a young girl, she hears at one stage that Mordecai isn't doing well. She sends for him. He can't come to her. He's mourning. We'll get there a little bit later. He's in sackcloth. She sends him clothes. She says, please, uncle, cousin. Uh, I'm not sure what she called him. Um, uh, please, older cousin, uh, sir, uncle, Mordecai, please put some clothes on. Are you okay She's a caring, thoughtful, wonderful young lady. But she's not as perfect as you think she might have been. And this is really a story of redemption for everyone here. 
You know, so often we think Bible characters are perfect and that they, we, we, we emulate them. They're up there, but she was not nearly as perfect as might, we might think she is. Not like Mary, for example, not even close to Daniel. If we considered the example Daniel set, he sets a bad example for us because he really was perfect. He was even later in his life when they wanted to punish him. It said the king or the king's uh, government put spies in his life to go and check everything about him. They went into his browser history. They went into his backstories, Facebook, Instagram, you name it. Even MySpace. I mean, it was closed years ago. They couldn't find a single scrap of dirt on him. Esther, they would have found so much dirt on. Why do you say that, Sean? Well, the reality is um, she goes into the palace. She doesn't declare that she's a Jew. In actual fact, it's a secret. So she doesn't limit her diet. She literally says, unlike Daniel, who says, I won't eat this, she ate everything they put in front of her. She doesn't tell them she's a Jew. She doesn't worship at the synagogue. She doesn't pray like Daniel prayed. In all essence, there is no trace of God in her life. As a good Jewish girl, we realize she's been put in a very tough position. But the night she's presented to the king, she's not presented to him for a quiz night. It's not board games. <laughs> she has premarital sex. She marries a pagan unbeliever completely against her faith. And she doesn't uphold any of the Jewish customs. She's not perfect. She's made a myriad of mistakes, a myriad of sins. She's in survival mode. And through survival mode, she still puts on a smile and she still respects everyone around her. And this is such a message of hope to us that later on when she gets her head in the game and she ends up being a key role play in delivering her people, should this be a message to us to say that any one of us, no matter what our past looks like, no matter how insignificant we are, no matter how bad we messed up, nothing could disqualify us from our past. There are things in our present that might disqualify us. There are certain sins that disqualify us in our present, but that doesn't mean you cannot repent, cannot put them behind you now and move on in God. It is a message of hope to everyone and anyone, no matter how and where they might find themselves. So Esther's the one person that we can hopefully identify with this morning. The other hero of the story is Mordecai. He cannot be ignored. So Mordecai seems to be uh, far more devout. He's older. He knows more of the faith. He's also a man in the faith, so he would have studied more of the Scripture. He's the one that stands at the city gates. He's the one that upholds Jewish customs, stays connected with the Jews, and he's an integral part of what's going on. Now, while all of this is happening, Esther has become queen. Mordecai is still her friend. She's communicating with him, even with his little notes and servants going up and down. They're keeping some communication. God is at work bringing Esther into government, but Satan is also at work. And this unravels another plan that there is always, has always, will always be an enemy, not just attacking you, but attacking what you stand for, attacking your God and his people. And Haman, Haman the Agagite has just been elected as the prime minister of Persia. This is the same position that Daniel held in previous administrations, the number two in the land. Now, Haman the Agagite, that's how they refer to him. He's not just Haman, he's Haman the Agagite. That's not a mistake. You see, the Agagite is actually a very, very important point that needs to be made. What is an Agagite? Well, funny thing you ask, I'm gonna tell you. You see, many, many, many years ago, when God's people were escaping Egypt, the Amalekites attacked them, even though they were vulnerable. There was women and children. They were dead set to hurt the Israelites. And God issued a decree in Exodus 17, 14, that he would utterly block out the memory of King Amalek from under the heaven. He goes on to say in verse 16 of Exodus 17, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. God declares war on the Amalekites under King Amalek because of what they did to his people, because they wanted to wipe his people off the face of the earth. 400 years later, God says to Saul, he says, you 
will wipe out the Amalekites. In 1 Samuel 15, he says basically, he says, 15.3, he says, now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. In that space, the king over the Amalekites is a guy by the name of King Agag. Haman the Agagite is a descendant of King Agag. You see, Saul, God removes his favor from him after this battle because Saul doesn't destroy them. He actually takes Agag home with him. Samuel the prophet comes and sees what's happening here. He's so disgusted that Samuel the prophet pulls out a sword. And I I, I do not exaggerate. The scripture literally says he hacked Agag to pieces right where he stood. And we even see here the remnants of disobedience 400 years later because that wasn't done, because they weren't annihilated. How this one man with a hatred for the Jewish people comes up against them and almost orchestrates the entire genocide of God's people. You see, the devil is also at work trying to come against us. He's a sworn enemy of God's people. What happens is, I don't want to tell the whole story. I want to get to some other meaty stuff. But it's such a beautiful story. Eh? Are you enjoying the story so far? Are you with me? Can you see it? That's awesome. Okay, what happens is, uh, because he's the prime minister, everyone needs to bow towards him. He doesn't just have a blue lights brigade. People don't just have to pull off. They literally have to get out their cars and go, we're not worthy. And so that's his story. So he's coming through the gates, blue light brigade. Everyone climbs off the camels. They bow, except for Mordecai. He's like, what's up? (laughs) So... (laughs) Haman is not a happy camper. He's like, okay, I'm going to kill you. He finds out he's a Jew. He's like, I'm not going to, I'm your, your, my people. I'm going to contact your people. It's like, we are done. So he goes to the king, Haman, in Esther 3 verse 8. And he says to King uh, Xerxes, a, a Hesurius, uh, depending on which name you're calling him. There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the peoples of all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of every other people. They do not keep the king's laws so that it is not to the king's profit to tolerate them. If it please the king, let it be decreed that they be destroyed and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver. This Haman guy, is super wealthy. 10,000 talents of silver is equivalent to about 375 tons of silver. He is not a poor man. But this Haman, uh, Mordecai, is a thorn in his side. He says, King, I will give you 375 tons of silver so that you can pay for the destruction of these people. Uh, Charge it to your business. Put it into your treasuries. The king took his signet ring from his hand, gave it to Haman the Agagite, and he said, and the king said, the money is given back to you. I don't need the money. The people do to them as you see fit. This evil man has just signed the genocide of, some theologians will say there may have been anything up to a million Jews in the Persian Empire. It's like, I don't even need to think about it. Keep your money, bro. It doesn't matter. Here's the ring. Go do what you want to do. So, what happens is Haman sends out a message and basically on a certain day, not a soon day, it's many months from now, anyone that has got anything against a Jew is legally allowed to slaughter them, their whole family. And in that space, not just are they allowed to kill them, but they're allowed to take everything they own, everything they possess. So it becomes a lottery. Anywhere in the kingdom, if there's a Jew in your town, it's like, hey man, fair game, your time's coming. I would imagine we could write a hundred books on the stories that happen across the 127 provinces of people that had it in, that saw uh, young Jewish girls they liked and they went to the father and they said, I'm coming for your daughter on this day and there's nothing you can do and I'm taking your house as well. I'm coming for you. You're dead. You're not allowed to defend yourself across the nation. There was, there was, 
weeping and wailing. Mordecai rips his clothes, puts sackcloth on. There's fasting and praying across the entire. Can you imagine if news was said today, you and your people on this day, you're done. You're wiped off the face of the earth. There's nothing you can do to protect yourself. You are fair game. We're coming for you. It's terrifying. But it's not the first time it's happened. The king has tried to wipe the, the king. The devil has tried to wipe us off the face of the earth for years. At the time when Moses was born, he kills all the babies because they're becoming too strong. Jesus is born, kills all the babies because Jesus is coming. Not so long ago, there was this thing called the Holocaust. You think that was just a guy with a funny mustache? I mean, absurd. The fact that he looked the opposite to the people he thought were God's chosen people. It's like a broken story. He's this high, dark hair, funny moustache. The Aryan race is that high. They're blonde and we're going to kill everyone that doesn't look like that except me. You think that's daft? ISIS right now. Media and pop culture how they are attacking what we believe and what we stand for. You look at it, you think, is this real? It's absurd. And it is attacking people to a degree where I've, I've enjoyed speaking to people that don't believe in God for many years. I enjoy engaging in conversation with people that do not believe in God. But I met a young lady the other day who was actually born to a pastor in America, she knows about Jesus. She said she's she not a not a follower of Jesus, and I was trying to convince her without our realizing what she actually believed that Jesus was real. She stopped me. She said, "I believe Jesus is real. I just don't like him. I hate what he stands for. I could never love him." I believe the Bible. Great stories. Got too many friends that he's against. Don't like the guy. There is an assault on what we believe and who we are. And it's, it's absurd. We look at it, we're like, what? How's that possible? It's because it's not human. It cannot be negotiated with. It cannot be reasoned with. Don't even try reason with it. You pray it out. You don't fight a spiritual attack with logic. You fight it on your knees. That's how they did it. So how do we respond? How do we respond in this hostile world? How do we make things right? Well, probably the most famous portion of the scripture, Esther chapter four. Mordecai calls Esther to intervene, to basically wake up and start being who she was born to be. In Esther 4.11, it reads like this. All the king's servants and the people of the king's promises know. She, so he calls her to intervene. She says, hey, hey, hang on a sec. This is her response. Verse 11. All the king's servants and the people of the king's province know that if a man or a woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being summoned or called, there is but one law. They are to be put to death, except to the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he may live. But as for me, I have not even been called to come to the king for 30 days. And they told Mordecai what Esther had said. Then Mordecai told them to reply this to Esther. Do not think of yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all of the other Jews. And this is the verse that we all know. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Friends, we are all born of a royal lineage. Our father is a king. We have all been chosen to this royal position, whether you are in a palace or wherever. You are royalty. You have been plucked up from a group of people that were heading somewhere else. You were liberated, 
saved and redeemed. You have royal blood coursing through your veins. You have a new father, a new destiny, and a new calling. And you have not been saved so that you can grow old and die. You have not been saved just to fill seats in a church. You have not been saved just so you can know scriptures, even if that is what you're trying to do. Because I don't think it's possible to know scriptures and not get busy. I preached to the youth on Friday night about the tests that God brings. And I said the tests that we face are not just knowledge-based. You don't get to cram. When God tests you, he goes, okay, it's time for my godly quiz. Let's see if you're going to become a, a better Christian. Here we go. Where did Paul leave his jacket in the Bible? Do you want to phone a friend? Phone a friend. Okay, the Bible says Troas. I will accept on the floor because he was a man. That's not how the tests of God work. Something comes to you and you get shook. And whatever's in comes out. If it's bad stuff, you fail and you have to go through that test again. If it's good stuff, you pass and you possibly don't have to go through that test again. You don't get to cram for God's tests. They lifestyle. We were called to make a difference. And he says, who knows that you were called to this position to make this difference now. So she says, okay, okay. Reply, go and tell the Jews to be found in Susa, the city where we live, to hold a fast on my behalf. Do not eat or drink for three days. I will tell my woman to do so as well. And then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. If I perish, I perish. She could have said, okay, this is what needs to happen. You know what's against the law. He needs to call me. Go fast and pray that he calls me. 50-50. She could have made many excuses. She could have said, go fast and pray. Mordecai, you're a better speaker than me. You, you, you know the Jewish people. I, I haven't been to synagogue in years, man. Come on, Uncle Mordi. You, I'll, pray, I'll fast for you, Boyki. I will take you in. I'll, I'll stand there by the door. I'll get you all the way to the door. You, she says, okay, I'll fast, I'll pray. You pray with me. If I die, I die. Let's do this. She follows the example set by Mordecai. Probably the only, I don't know, maybe the only place she saw. We're not explained the life that she lived. He fasted, he tore his clothes. She didn't tear her clothes. Uh, but sackcloth, I don't think he would have invited her in if she was wearing sackcloth. He's not that kind of king. Um, uh, and so she prepares herself. She beautifies herself. She goes and stands right at the door. Now the reality is right there in the door. The historians say that in his inner chamber, there was a long, long, long corridor with pillars next to it. The entrance was right at the end of the corridor. Right next to the entrance, there was an executioner right there. Apparently, he wielded an axe. It could have been a sword. I don't know. But if you walked in and the king saw you, there you are in his doorway. He's ready with his axe. The king lifts his scepter. You come in. He doesn't. Right there. No trial. No what are you doing here. If he looks at you, he's busy talking to someone else. He doesn't notice you. He looks away. That guy goes, did he see her? Didn't he see her? Oh, well, we'll check later. That's how simple it is. She walks in. The king's in a good mood. He's like, hey, Queenie, come here, my baby. Okay, I'm paraphrasing a little bit. He says, come here, come here. How's it? Well, you look lovely as always. I haven't seen you. What's it been like? 30 days. I've been with my concubine. Sorry about that. He's like, uh, what do you want, my girl? You can have anything up to half my kingdom. You're like thinking, yes, that's what we prayed for. Tell him what we want. She says, King, all I want is to have dinner with you and Haman. Mordecai must have thought, oh dear, Jesus, help me. Okay, Jesus wasn't on the scene yet. Oh dear, God, help me. Dear God, help me. This guy, if he sees me again, if this blue light brigade comes past you, I promise you he's going to run me over with his camel. He's going to run me. I'm not bowing for him. Just tell him. Okay, dinner comes. It's like throws this feast, there they are, opportunity. King says, okay, my girl, you tell me any, anything you want up to half my kingdom. She goes, well, I want to have another dinner with you. Mordecai's like, I'm, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm, I'm, I'm done. But you, she was about to reveal a secret she had kept from the king. He didn't know she was Jewish. 
She was about to reveal secrets he didn't know. She was about to call out an edict with his stamp on it, with his ring on it. She was about to call him out. She was about to call out his number two. She was terrified. But God's still working even through her weakness, even through her fear. You see what happens is you can't write this stuff. She has the dinner on the first night and she says, I want dinner tomorrow night. Okay, King says, okay, great, dinner. Haman leaves walking on cloud nine. Yay, I'm on top of the world. I'm not gonna sing. I sang in my last sermon. He's on top of the world. Uh, He goes home. He tells his wife, well, on his way home, he passes Mordecai. Bible says... He needed to restrain himself from killing him. He gets back to his wife. He's like, it's so amazing. He tells all his friends, his 10 sons, I've got more money than God. He doesn't believe in God. He says something else. I've got more money than anyone else. I'm the man. The queen even just wants me to dine with her. I'm amazing. But this Mordecai, his wife says, why don't you just kill him? It's like, why didn't I think of that? So he erects a gallows. Actually, they didn't hang people. They impaled people. He erects this pole. The Bible says nearly six stories high. He wanted to make an example. It's a tall story, I know. But he wanted to make an example of this guy. So he erects this pole and he's ready. He's going to the king the next morning. He's gonna say, let's kill this guy. I've had enough. That night, the king can't sleep. I wonder why. Because they fasted and prayed, man. King can't sleep. So that he calls, he's rich enough that he doesn't have to read for himself. If Asterix and Obelix were in the story, the reader would be called audiobooks. Anyway, so the, I don't know what the reader's name was. The reader comes, let's call him audiobooks. He comes and he starts reading history. You want to fall asleep, you read history. Starts reading history. He finds out that there was a guy at the gates called Mordecai that saved his life. The king's like, What? Mordecai saved my life. Yes, Mordecai saved your life. There was an assassination attempt. He got word to Esther. Esther told you, we thwarted it. We, we, just one of the million guys we executed. You must have forgotten. We impaled the guys again. It's like, we got to get more original with this stuff. We impaled the guys again. The king's like, stop the bus. What did we do for Mordecai? Nothing. We got to honor this guy somehow. If Esther had asked him a day before, this story doesn't unfold. God's timing is perfect, perfect, perfect. Anyway, so the next morning, Haman comes in. Yes, I'm gonna kill Mordecai today, yeah. He gets into the king's chamber. The king goes, Haman, Haman, my man, just the guy I wanna, just the guy I wanna chat to. I've got a question for you. Are you ready? I wanna read it, uh, I wanna read it to you. Um, uh, he, 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 he says here in Esther chapter six, verse six, he says, he says to Haman, he says, if there's someone in the kingdom that I wanna greatly honor, Haman's like, who else would he want to honor other than me? He's like, what should I do? And so Haman says, Haman says, Haman said to the king, for the man whom the king delights to honor, let royal robes be brought, which the king has worn and the horse that the king has written and on whose head the royal crown is set. Let the robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials. Maybe Esther, I don't know. Let them dress the man of whom the king delights to honor and let them lead him on the horse through the square of the city, proclaiming before everyone nice and loud, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. The king goes, Haman, brilliant idea. Have you met Mordecai? (laughs) As my kids would say, worst day ever. (laughs) Mordecai going through the streets. This is what will be done. Mordecai's like, louder, Haman, louder. Thank you. He gets done with this. He cannot stop fast enough. I'm sure he nearly kicks him off the horse. He goes, stomps home to his wife. He's like, worst day. While he's busy whining, the king's bodyguard come to fetch him to dinner that night. It's like, at least the queen loves me. Gets there and the king says, anything up to half my kingdom. She says, oh, good king. Please just spare my life. She tells him the story. The king is viciously angry. She says, it is Haman. Haman's like, no! He realizes who she is. The king's furious. He storms out. I'm sure he's looking for a spear or something to throw. 
Haman, so desperate, he goes to plead for his life to Esther. He falls on top of her in the process. The king goes in, he goes, and now he wants to molest my wife as well. Kill him. One of the guys go, funny thing you should say that. Right in Haman's back garden, there's an impaling spike that has just been built. He's like, kill him on that thing. You see, the Lord will use the plans that the devil has intended for your downfall and he will turn them around for your good. Not only does Haman get killed on the spike he built, but long story short, Mordecai is given Haman's position as the most powerful man in the land. He's given all of Haman's riches as well. The 375 Tons of silver are now Mordecai's. They issue a new decree that any Jewish person can defend themselves and protect themselves. It says a fear comes over the land for people that have said or done anything to the Jews, that people are converting to Judaism in the hundreds because they want the favor that is now on them. They kill on that two or three day stretch, 75,000 enemies of God. Man of God, second most powerful man in the land. All of the Jewish folk saved. And because they serve a different God, they were allowed to take the possessions of everyone they killed. Other than Mordecai, no one took their possessions. Because we have cut from a different cloth. We serve a different God. And we are driven by different things. So in closing, I want to mention a couple things as I hope the story has been burnt into your brain. I don't even need to explain these points for you to see them happening. Number one, God uses nobodies with checkered pasts and questionable testimonies because he's a God of second, third, fourth, and fifth chances. He's a God of hope. He's a God of redemption. God uses nobodies. If you are willing to change today, tomorrow you will be used, no matter what's going on. The providence of God, number two, is the main theme of this book. Providence basically means God protecting and guarding his people. His name was never mentioned in the book, but we see him all over. And God will do this. Just let me keep it as recent as possible. Friday night, Melissa left youth with my last born son, Zach, in the car. And she was going home. And at the West End Robot, there was a truck. She couldn't see an oncoming car coming on the other side. She put her foot down to go through the robot. It was a red light. And her foot slipped off the accelerator. She slipped, slipped. She's like, yeah. She nearly stalled the car and this car flew past the front of her. The providence of God. There's a man sitting here today. I asked him if I could share his testimony that up until recently had to move out of his house. And he said he was, he was in his movable truck at the end of the driveway. He had place for his kids to stay the night and he didn't know where he was going to stop. And he was in his driveway and a friend phoned him and he said, have you got somewhere to stay? He said, I don't. He said, well, I was renting out this place, but the people have just canceled and I want you to live there free of charge. I don't know what God had to do to make those people cancel, but behind the scenes, God is moving. I don't know what my wife had to step in here at Friday Night Live to give her a slippery shoe sole. Maybe she was on her phone. I don't know. Maybe she couldn't tell me. She was. Maybe someone sent her a WhatsApp. I don't know. No, she wasn't. God is working behind the scenes. Third point, God is in control of your where and when for such a time as this. Acts 17, 26, that he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and boundaries for their dwelling. 
the delay of Esther of waiting three days before asking, even though she could have asked on the first, orchestrated the most amazing turnaround in the history of man, the most amazing comeback. God knows your where and your when. He knows His timing. And sometimes that timing doesn't make sense to you. Sometimes you think He's forgotten you. Sometimes you think the world is against you. His timing is perfect. He's never late. And lastly, there is a real enemy working in the world. A real enemy. Not just out to get you as a person, but out to get God. And your collateral damage. So in that space, no matter what we're going through, we look for God. We look for His agent. We look for His Esther. We look for His Mordecai. Who can we come alongside? If we don't see Esther or Mordecai, you know what? You're it. God, what do you want me to do in this situation? Because I can't see your agent. I must be it. What do you need me to do? And you fast and you pray and you fight the battle where it counts. This is how we fight our battles, on our knees. And God's kingdom will prevail. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, I wanna thank you so much for stories like this, stories of hope, stories of deliverance, stories of your power, stories of your involvement. And I wanna thank you, Father God, that your people, your people will be delivered by your mighty hand. We think of the world we live in today and that which comes against your church. And we pray, Father God, that you would protect your people that you would vindicate your people. We thank you, Father, for not just people in this country, but countries all over the world that are facing oppression of every kind that we can believe and have faith in you. And we thank you, Father, that no matter where we find ourselves, you're working behind the scenes, your providence is there. Help us to see you in the fine print. Help us to see you in the shadows. Help us to recognize your work and partner with you, not work against you by thinking we know better. Deliver us from evil, we pray, Father. And help us to see the big picture. For our battle is not against flesh and blood, but powers and principalities of darkness. We love you, Lord. Thank you that we're on the winning side. Help us to make the right choices. Help us to represent you well for the sake of all that have gone before and for the sake of all that would come after. In Jesus' name we pray.